Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the session on the ESG Masterclass for Investors. We are here to speak about a very important topic today about ESG mandates and their application in the emerging uh, and emerging markets. Bloomberg estimates that uh, 33% of all assets under management globally would have ESG mandates by 2025, uh, representing nearly 53 trillion. There's an increasing focus on uh, ESG driven by companies, central banks, and development projects. However, there is still a struggle to understand how to implement ESG successfully. A uh, shift in perspective from risk management to long-term value creation would help in this journey. And robust and pragmatic measures to implement ESG metrics uh, and assess the risks for each deal are really important. This uh, alignment of ESG metrics with the investment cycle helps investors understand the potential opportunities for value creation, minimize reputational risks, address investment risks, and demonstrate the proper management to LPs and other stakeholders. Uh, thank you once again for joining today. We have a distinguished panel of experts to guide us on our ESG journey. We'll be starting uh, with a small introduction to the session. Uh, but before that, I would like to introduce each of the speakers uh, who have graciously given us their time today. We have uh, Smita Hari, who is the Senior Vice President for Sustainable Finance and ESG at Octa CSG. She's a finance professional with over 16 years of corporate and entrepreneurial experience and has significant experience across sustainable finance, ESG, corporate banking, impact investment, and investment banking. Uh, welcome, Smita, and uh, I would in, uh, like you to say a few words about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Utsav. Thanks, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be a part of Sun Sankalp every year. Uh, so uh, I think you've, you've given me, given an introduction of myself. I uh, just wanted to highlight that uh, my last role was with a large private sector bank in their impact investing uh, division around debt solutions uh, for high impact companies. And I think uh, uh, at Optus, uh, what we are doing is, you know, looking at how ESG can be integrated into uh, financial solutions, investors and banks alike. And uh, this, the whole space is, you know, evolving so fast. And I think uh, it's going to be an exciting session today. So let's look forward to it. Yeah. Thanks, Smita. And next we have uh, Tejaswini. She is the principal and head of ESG at SPI Cap Ventures. Professional with over 16 years global leadership experience across the investment cycle for MNCs as well as zero to one businesses. She led the ESG and impact function at India's largest and first climate focused fund managed by Eversource Capital. And currently, she is, as we mentioned, uh, the ESG, uh, she's leading ESG for India's largest social impact fund, SPI Cap Ventures. Um, over to you, uh, Tejaswini, for a quick intro. Thanks, Utsav, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I believe you've already given that introduction, but what I just wanted to relay is that before these uh, two experiences, I've also been in consulting for over 14 years, which has really taught me a lot, and that gave me an opportunity to work with uh, you know several investors as well as corporations. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to leveraging uh, my experience and sharing it uh, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tejaswini. And finally, we have Soumya, who is the Director for Impact and ESG at Avishkar Capital. She has over 14 years of experience in analyzing and recommending growth of inclusive business models across clean energy, financial inclusion, education, and agri sectors in India. She heads the Impact Measurement and Management and ESG Department at ESG. And uh, I would like to welcome her to say a few words. Uh, it's, uh, it's Avishkar Capital that I'm heading uh, at this function at. Uh, we are a global uh, pioneer impact fund manager. Uh, we are part of the Avishkar group. Uh, we have an AUM of $550 million. We've made about investments in 70-odd companies uh, in across India, uh, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and now Africa as well. Uh, so the primary role is, you know, uh, what my team and I, we're trying to do is uh, deliver impact uh, and ESG value across the various uh, impact funds of Avishkar and also work very closely with the 
the investment team to implement, monitor, and report on both impact as well as ESG. Uh, so we've been um, doing this since 2014, rather 2012, uh, for all our companies. And uh, it's very exciting to see how the entire space has evolved over the last decade, right? So uh, I'm happy to share uh, what we have learned, as well as also listen to Tejaswini and Sultan, you know, how they are, um, you know, implementing ESG as well. So happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Somya. I'll uh, move on to introducing the uh, session with a brief in overview of uh, uh, how things are emerging for ESG in uh, new economies. Um, please let me know if you can see my screen. All right, thank you. So um, let's begin first of all with the cost of the energy transition. The latest IPCC report mentions that uh, investments of about three to six of current levels are needed to limit the warming of the planet to 1.5 to 2 degrees as per the Paris Agreement. And this investment is needed across all sectors and all regions as per the Director of uh, Monetary and Capital Markets of IMF uh, this April 2022. So uh, this means that uh, uh, while the urgency is recognized and the space is evolving, we are nowhere near the investment levels needed to actually achieve that uh, transition. So what is exactly now, uh, you know, stopping and what are the barriers and costs of uh, implementing this energy transition? In emerging markets, there are underdeveloped capital markets. It is hard to access finance and cost of capital is high. Economic activity is often dependent on carbon and water intensive sectors like mining, agriculture and heavy industry. There's underdeveloped or aging infrastructure as well, which needs to be replaced at a high cost. And uh, there's a reliance on cheap fossil fuel, which, uh, which powers economies. So the cost of transition as estimated by the International Energy Agency is about 4 trillion per year through 2050 globally. And specifically, countries are at risk who are dependent on hydrocarbon they are at risk of losing about 9 trillion per year in revenue uh, by, by 2040. And 95% of these 40 countries are based in emerging countries. So basically, uh, basically the uh, transition is, has never been more important for emerging economies, uh, even considering the significant costs. Having said that, there is some good news. 2021 was a breakout year for sustainable financial markets. The share of ESG issuances uh, went to about 200 billion um, in emerging markets, which is almost 40% of the, all the cumulative investments since 2015 of about 500 billion. There were record ESG equity flows, uh, about 25 billion in 2021, again, an increase over and above uh, the flows in 2020. We hear a lot about the dominance of China, but it is other countries as well, like uh, Chile, which had a sustainable debt issuance of almost 12% of its GDP, followed by Peru and Mexico at about 2% of GDP and followed by India. So we have a lot of positive momentum happening in this area, which is pushing the case for a sustainable finance. Sustainable finance has been shown to uh, improve and create green infrastructure provide for an energy transition and create jobs for uh, emerging economies. But what is the challenge for companies? Why do they still find ESG difficult to uh, implement? Uh, some of the common perceptions or complaints are that it is a distraction from the main business model of the company. It is too difficult uh, to implement. There are so many things, uh, there are so many so many acronyms in the ESG space that is, it is hard to understand what to do, what not to do. And it's not measurable in a practical sense. And finally, there's no meaningful correlation to financial performance. These are the common perceptions and complaints uh, by uh, funds and companies uh, looking to do this. But unfortunately, what they don't realize is uh, for company performance, there is a need for social license. And we are at the cusp of paradigm shifting externalities, which will change the financial stability and the business environment. 
The social license is granted by stakeholders beyond the company. Uh, uh, it could be the uh, uh, supply chain, it could be the customers, it could be larger society. And the companies need to demonstrate fairness, appropriateness, and trust in the way they perform their uh, duties. So understanding and connecting with uh, the stakeholders for the social license and preparing for the externalities is key for uh, this sector. Some recommendations for developing sustainable finance in emerging markets are to strengthen the climate information architecture, to address data quality gaps and challenges, to provide a formal definition for green finance, and also to integrate ESG into business models. Data disclosure as per, as per global standards. We're not there yet. Uh, there are still some, uh, uh, there is still some momentum over there and it has to be finalized, but we're moving towards that. And finally, to incentivize green projects. Overall, this would help emerging mar markets get more and attract more finance uh, to their uh, respective markets. And some of the trends to watch out for in 2022 are, uh, we'll see more and more climate discussions happening. We'll see the mainstreaming of ESG. And there would be still emerging risks and opportunities where ESG would make sense, like uh, lifestyle changes in terms of the consumption of popular foods, from uh, meat to other sources, potential health crisis, and a just transition. So these are some of the things which uh, are upcoming and of importance, which will also drive the conversation around ESG. So thank you for uh, uh, that uh, uh, listening in to that quick introduction to the sector. We'll move on to now Smita for a presentation on the risks and moving beyond uh, risks and op to opportunities in the ESG space. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Utsav. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So while the slides are up, uh, is coming up, um, I just wanted to say good afternoon, good morning to everybody dialing in from different parts of the world. Uh, so before we jump on to today's topic, uh, let me just give you a brief introduction about Octa CSG, the firm I represent. So Octa CSG is a global advisory firm uh, working in the areas of sustainable finance, ESG, and climate strategy across markets in uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And uh, our core offering is, you know, designing uh, ESG risk and resilience solutions uh, on, you know, integrating ESG into business strategies, lending decisions, investing decisions, and such like. And uh, we see, you know, during our interactions with financial institutions that while ESG investing is fast emerging as a you know, it's, it's been a tool to build resilience and mitigate risks across investments. Uh, in many cases, returns of, it, returns of an investment can be enhanced, you know, by incorporating material ESG considerations um, into investing decisions. So over the next uh, 12 to 15 minutes or so, I would like to touch upon this aspect on why ESG investing should not just consider, you know, the reduction in risks, but also look at the increased opportunities, so to say. Uh, next slide, please. So worldwide, the adoption of ESG has, you know, increased with about 90% of S&P 500 companies, uh, you know, reporting on ESG or climate. So uh, like Utsav was mentioning some time back, the value of global assets applying some degree of, you know, ESG data uh, to drive investment decisions has grown tremendously and is expected to be about one third of, you know, global AUM by 2025. And of course, the pandemic has only heightened the focus of ESG, right? Uh, so the slide on the right just talks about UNPRI signatories, you know, and we can see that substantial portion of the AUM is concentrated in Europe. However, given that there is global interconnectedness, you know, this would result in a cascading effect across markets, including emerging economies. Uh, so increasing regulatory requirements also are, you know, kind of forcing a greater uptake of ESG integration. So all in all, ESG factors are fast becoming core considerations in um, you know, investment decision processes, rather than just being a post facto action, so to say. Uh, next slide, please. So you know, without spending too much time on this slide, uh, because I, I'm, I'm guessing this will you know, get covered later, uh, later on in the session, essentially what I want to emphasize is that ESG as a concept, you know, can be truly integrated only when this is done uh, right from the initial screening stage up until the fund 
exists the investments. So while screening and due diligence aid in you know, reinforcing the fund's values in making investing decisions, there is great scope of value creation during the holding stage. Uh, reporting of you know, ESG aspects of, of the investments to LPs, uh, it's also very critical. And finally, at exit, you know, linking the company's ESG performance to the value which has been created and ensuring that the investee's ESG management system is self-sustaining you know, beyond the exit. That becomes uh, very important. Uh, next slide. So, you know, traditionally, uh, ESG has been synonymous with risks. Uh, however, moving beyond risks and considering ESG with a value creation lens is what can give investors an edge, you know. So what this essentially means is that integrating ESG across business functions, you know, like strategy, operations, risk management, finance, and even HR decisions for that matter, uh, such that it impacts, you know, product life cycle up until delivery, you know, so covering uh, design, R&D, procurement, and ultimately to its integration into uh, customer relationship management. So uh, like an overall package, so to say. Of course, this will uh, differ depending on the sector, geography, et cetera. But consideration of ESG issues in business operations uh, brings greater cohesion you know, between policies and performance. And for a fund doing this integration at an individual company level uh, in the portfolio is increasingly becoming relevant, mainly through stewardship activities. Uh, next slide, please. So having a strong ESG proposition you know, across all the three buckets, uh, because E, S, and G components are strongly intertwined at some level, uh, you know, and taking a proactive approach, uh, keeping in mind, you know, increasing investor and regulatory pressures uh, has become very important. So ESG is usually perceived to be an additional cost, you know, as uh, I think Utsav had mentioned some time back. Uh, so in other words, you know, compromised returns. However, recent uh, studies have shown, you know, quite the opposite. That is, ESG considerations can actually offer many benefits. So on the screen, you can see a few you know, potential opportunities for both funds as well as investee companies you know, on adopting an ESG-focused approach. So while I will delve into this, uh, you know, deeper into this uh, in the subsequent slides, what I would want to highlight at this point is that moving beyond risks, uh, moving beyond you know, just a good image or happy employees, and actually making ESG, a, ESG investing a business case uh, can result in a host of benefits. Uh, so over the next few slides, I'll just run you through each of these points uh, quickly. Uh, next slide, please. So theme-based ESG investing is picking up, you know, and on the back of, uh, you know, growing interest from asset owners and clients as well. And this could focus on, you know, specific themes like clean energy, e-mobility, or even diversity and inclusion, or human rights for that matter. So actually the S of ESG has started gaining prominence. So while environment and climate are you know, talked about a lot, uh, the social aspects, you know, especially on the back of initiatives like the Investor Alliance for Human Rights, uh, the UNPRI and uh, you know, UN guiding principles, all this has kind of uh, emerged as an important theme for investors. Uh, on the environment side, of course, growing climate risks, you know, both physical and transition risks, uh, present an attractive opportunity, both from, uh, you know, decarbonization pathways, so to say, as well as, you know, business models uh, around adaptation and resilience building. Uh, and this presents an opportunity for increased investments in innovative models, you know, in clean energy. So just wanted to highlight a case uh, in point here, uh, a global P firm, which has invested about six, uh, $450 million into the renewable energy sector in Asia Pacific region. So looking at, you know, leveraging the opportunity of transition into clean energy uh, by increasing capabilities across uh, technologies like solar, wind, uh, battery storage, and green hydrogen. Uh, in fact, you know, the International Energy Agency forecasts the world's total renewable-based uh, power capacity to increase by 50%. Uh, uh, that was from 2019 to 2024. So there's a huge potential there. And moving from, you know, 
exclusionary screening to more positive screening and impact investing strategies uh, you know, can help in identifying potential opportunities and leveraging them. Um, next slide, please. So here I would like to you know, address financial performance, not just from an increased revenue perspective, but also from a reduced cost perspective. So improved financial performance due to ESG becomes more you know, marked over longer time horizons. So it's more visible. ESG investing you know, appears to provide downside protection, especially in times of crisis. But during normal course of business, you know, reduced costs because of adopting um, an ESG lens can come about because of you know, reduced OPEX. So lower energy, lower footprint, water footprint costs, for example, these are uh, good examples which can uh, demonstrate lower costs. So just an example here again to highlight, a 635 million uh, you know, euro P fund, which focus on you know, driving resource efficiency and pollution control and targeting SMEs has generated significant savings as you can see on the screen. So basically they measure progress of ESG performance of portfolio companies against KPIs, you know, like avoided emissions, energy, and water savings, among others. And by disclosing these impact numbers, the PE fund also communicates its own alignment and commitment uh, towards these uh, issues. Next slide, please. So on products, uh, innovations around products and technologies like you know, uh, climate tech, fintech, and deep tech innovations, these are on the rise. So technologies like AI, for example, are increasingly being used uh, from an ESG lens. So I again here a company uh, which is present across emerging markets in Asia in the deep tech space, which provides innovative solutions on tackling climate risks. And investors have seen you know, an increase in their value of investments with every successful round you know, on the back of unique product offerings. So from an investor's perspective, uh, when you invest in such interventions and products, uh, you know, these can provide significant upside to your investing, especially if there is a first mover advantage. Uh, next slide. So how can, uh, you know, regulations be an opportunity? So this is usually an understated opportunity and is often looked at from a risk lens. Uh, ESG is changing businesses and slowly driving regulations. So, for example, the reporting landscape is rapidly uh, changing and as regulations increase globally, uh, ESG is taking on a very strong regulatory risk and compliance aspect as well. And failure to conform to regulatory requirements uh, aligned with ESG practices can lead to reputational risks. So uh, a US-based asset manager, you know, which was accused of misrepresenting ESG processes, uh, six of their funds were found to be you know, non-ESG funds and greenwashing uh, allegations as well. And there was a huge payout. And on the other side of the spectrum uh, are transparent governance practices and metrics. So for example, uh, there was this uh, global P fund, which you know, invested in one of the largest uh, Chinese infant formula manufacturers. And uh, this company came under a lot of, uh, you know, there was a huge milk scandal and followed by public outlash. So the, the fund actually approached a very, uh, took an ESG approach and that led to a creation of social value. And when they exited after five years, there was a 2.3x returns on the fund. Uh, next slide, please. This is pretty much a, you know, a, a self-explanatory slide on how ESG can actually help in attracting talent, have a longer retention of employees and increasing productivity you know, and job satisfaction translates to increase in productivity of the uh, output. And this similar, so this is more from a company standpoint, but a similar parallel can be drawn to funds as well, you know, in terms of attracting and uh, retaining talent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so taking an ESG approach can help in directing capital to sustainable sectors, you know, like renewables, waste reduction, sustainable food production, etc. And so this can also help investors avoid stranded investments, you know, that may not be paying off. So basically having a foresight into what would work and what would not work from an ESG standpoint can help in you know, repurposing assets into uses with uh, higher demand, more relevant um, in this case. Um, 
Next slide. And while, see all these aspects which we've saw, seen so far speak of leveraging opportunities, uh, perhaps, you know, effective communication is one of the most important in showcasing the practices, you know, basically building trust, demonstrating social relevance, uh, and ultimately, you know, attracting investors. So communicating clear purpose, strong stewardship uh, can lead to, you know, long-term value creation. Uh, so just a case in point here on, you know, the emerging regulations which are there, you know, both TCFT and SFD are being very, uh, you know, fast becoming relevant from an investor's uh, uh, standpoint. And uh, so having an ESG focused approach can help in effective regulations because it's just a matter of time before, um, you know, markets across the world start adopting these kind of, uh, you know, mandatory regulations. However, a word of caution again here is on the risks of greenwashing and being extremely careful on stating things, you know, as they are. Um, next slide. Uh, sorry, Smita. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've uh, really covered really good uh, uh, topics okay. and I have questions. But uh, just for a paucity of time, may I request we switch to Tejaswini and then we'll come back to you, Smita, so that we can continue our presentation. I do apologize uh, uh, for this uh, slight <laughs> interruption. If you can just uh, request. No worries. Smita, how many slides do you have? Maybe you can, Couple I think, more. towards the end, right? Couple yeah, go more, ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No okay. worries, Utsa. No I'll hang All in. Right. Yeah. Thank Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, so ultimately, having an ESG approach is to, you know, look at better capital raising opportunities, right? So uh, increasingly influencing capital allocation decisions across the spectrum of sources of funds is what kind of matters. And the growing trend of LPs, you know, towards long-term ESG funds rapidly accelerates, you know, credible and scalable ESG private equity strategies. Uh, in fact, there are different models of funding as well. So uh, just an example here, which I had come across. So in, I think a couple of years back, there's a Sweden-based private equity fund, uh, which announced uh, about $5 billion of ESG-linked fund-level bridge facility, which basically stipulates that portfolio companies will receive better financing terms as their ESG performance uh, progresses and improves. So it's a sustainability-linked kind of a payout. Uh, so these kind of models are emerging. Uh, of course, uh, the underlying factor is as LPs start looking at this more in, uh, you know, uh, start making it more important in their investing uh, criterion, it becomes, it just translates to GPs to kind of look at this as well. Um, next slide. So finally, while embedding ESG considerations across the investment cycle can help in leveraging opportunities, it is important to action these policies and intentions. So making ESG strategies as quantifiable as possible can help in you know, better reliability and comparability of data. So as mentioned earlier, incorporating ESG considerations in each step of the investment cycle is important rather than keeping it as standalone efforts and you know, mapping risks and opportunities relevant to the business model, sector and geography is also important. So a one size fits all will not uh, work. And lastly, ESG matters are not very well understood among you know, all partners or stakeholders. So capacity building uh, becomes very important uh, you know, and can go a long way in adoption and reviewal of these uh, processes. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, listening in. Thank you so much, Smita. It was really good to hear about how ESG is a core in investment uh, decision consideration and also to look at it at a value creation lens rather than just risk management. And further would definitely like to ask you to elaborate on uh, the social aspect and the other aspect, which is not as covered by uh, metrics and considerations while making investment decisions. Um, and we take your point about uh, the effective communication and disclosures which are required um, and the improved OPEX and lower costs that can be achieved uh, through this. So thank you very much, Smita. And over to Tejaswini for uh, discussing the uh, success outcomes of implementing SG. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Utsav, and uh, thank you, Smita. I think you gave a very good uh, headway into my topic. Um, so hello everyone again. I within the uh, SBI Cap Ventures, you know, I represent the Swami Fund. It is S W A M I H. 
it's basically a fund which is being created by our government of india uh, finance minister to uh, provide the last mile funding of the affordable housing projects which have been stuck for quite some years so uh, it that's that's how we are one of the social uh, uh, you know impact funds uh, that we represent right so with that um, i think what uh, you know smita mentioned uh, was a very good overview of you know where esg today is and that's what also uh, utsav relayed um what i'm going to talk today uh, again this is based on my experience and i'm i'm sharing this really on in, in a personal capacity is you know while all the investors and the investee companies and the you know portfolio companies so to say are really struggling with how how to incorporate esg uh, across the investment life cycle uh you know what are some of the you know the quick tips perhaps uh, which which we should keep in mind uh, and acknowledge as we continue to do that um so i believe that uh, investors today have wonderfully included equity and uh, inclusion in their scorecard uh however when it comes to esg what could really make a substantial difference is how we can really build the equity and inclusion as part of the culture and business as usual right so i think that really is is the intent of uh, my uh, short presentation today right so uh, smita also had a slide on this and i'm sure everybody is aware about uh, this is a typical investment life cycle which includes your screening due diligence decision making uh, legal agreements monitoring and finally the exit um now across this uh, i'm sure today the funds uh, and the investors are incorporating esg right from the beginning um you know and uh, you know it was it was also relayed the importance of doing that right so what can we really do at the very very initial stage and here i believe that just as ruthlessly uh, you know we prioritize all the potential risks as well as the opportunities during the screening stage uh, it is very important to prioritize high value as well as the low complexity esg issues uh within your relevant sector right so when it comes to your screening stage if you could have like a really customized yet a very simple screening tool uh which caters to the target portfolio or the target investee company that you are looking at and uh, you know it should be able to give you early on sectoral related risks as well as opportunities so the whole intent of doing this and based on my experience when i created like a excel based tool for the screening stage uh my endeavor was that you know even if as a esg professional if you know i'm i'm not available for any reason anybody from the investment team should be able to use it right and i believe uh, for all the esg professionals uh, you know i can i can confidently say that that esg clearly is not something that you know it's a one person's job we want to emulate it and spread it across the team right so i believe having a very simple tool uh, for the screening stage which saves your time uh, which gives you quick links and references to all the database that you can quickly look up uh, as part of your desktop and you know other reference reports that you want to look at but having a sectoral focus uh, is very important to give you those early risk and opportunities um during the due diligence stage you know i've i've mentioned the uh, kyc right uh, but here what i mean really is know your consultants um specifically within india the consulting and or the advisory market when it comes to esg and sustainability has been through a lot of turmoil and you know i come from one uh, so i i really know the market is is really chaotic and people have been moving from one place to the other you know some have left the company and joined the industry or the investors so uh, the traditional approach of you know procuring three proposals and then going by a the low cost uh, and i know that many funds or investors also look at the right talent uh but that part is very critical here you know as people move it's very important to understand whether you, are you still going by the brand name of the company or you know really digging in detail to understand whether they really have the right talent 
one of the observations which i've made over past couple of years is the social expertise uh, when it comes to conducting environment and social due diligence has really been scarce right so how do we really make a choice uh, you know go by the brand or really really take that risk of identifying new companies and i'm sure there are many companies which have now been set up at a smaller scale but they do have the right talent so here while we are also creating the rfps or the tors we need to tweak it again to ensure that you know it has the sectoral expertise but something which is very very specific to the site uh, you know to the mindset that the promoters have at the initial stage and if that can be captured as part of the due diligence it can really go a long way in identifying early risks and opportunities mm -hmm. uh decision making now of course you know i'm sure there are several uh, different approaches that everybody follows there could be one round of uh, you know invest committee meeting or it could there could be pre ics or preliminary ics whatever terminology is you use but it's very important that uh, you know as as uh, when it comes to the esg section when we identify the risks and we talk about the mitigation and the you know the level of risk we also talk about the opportunity and the possible leverage it could have on the deal uh, because i believe uh, we we need to move to that stage where esg is really looked as a enabler uh, you know rather than a derailer right so that's very important and the other aspect when we are uh, you know at the cusp of decision making process it's important to identify the cps or the condition precedents that we base uh, our esg uh, risks and observations on um, because often you know we we limit to the compliance related aspects as cps right but some of the cultural related aspects the mindset related aspects or just the intent or the purpose related aspect of the promoter if we could use the as as cps and i believe that's the only time when you, we can really push the ball on esg and if we could make a headway out there as a cp uh, you know that would be very beneficial for the deal as well as i think to implement uh, you know a lot of these uh, frameworks around esg down the line will become easier agreements i won't get into it's a very legal uh, standard agreements uh, generally that everybody follows but the idea is that wherever possible uh, and feasible if you could influence the uh, the promoters or the portfolio companies to do better when it comes to esg performance and obviously moving just beyond compliance uh, this is my favorite part of portfolio monitoring uh, you know just just going by the certain experience and the learnings of course i believe that for a successful monitoring uh, you know it's very important that there is continual collaboration now i've used the word continual very you know cautiously because we don't just want continuous collaboration i believe that's not practical uh you know everybody has to agree that esg is is a journey and it's it's a gradual process it's not going to happen overnight from uh, the portfolio companies but rather than you know policing uh, the the investing companies it's very important to come across i think the perception aspect is also very important right so some of these softer skills can go a long way uh, from the very beginning so having that Uh, environment of collaboration is is very very critical and keeping it recent which means that you know we don't just wait for the monthly reports or the quarterly reports but maybe just pick up the phone have a chat with them on a regular basis uh, again not keeping it very transactional uh, but you know also ensuring that if if there is some way that you can collaborate with them on some of the thought leadership platforms Uh, you know work on some of the white papers these are just examples i'm sure there are several ways of you know working with them beyond just uh, the mandate that you have on esg and lastly on exit uh, you know uh, again it's very important to highlight and sometimes i believe the esg function is a little bit shy uh, you know during the exit phase to to really sort of boldly bring out their uh, the additionality uh that has uh, come to the company because of a good esg performance uh, you know it could it could be a varied performance on esg i'm sure but whatever additionality the company has gotten there uh it's important to highlight and just be bold about it and talk about it 
right and overall i believe as we want to keep up with the industry 4.0 it's very important to also digitize your esg um, you know uh, not just uh, because you may have several portfolio or several sites but it's also the different stages that you are juggling between right so digitizing esg uh, which means that you know you will also have to digitize your overall uh, process and esg is one part of it but as much as possible try and see if you know you are able to sort of create like a dashboard which is going to give you some comparative outlook on you know how your portfolio companies are performing on you know let's say the social aspects versus the environmental aspects and even within them so that it gives you a quick snapshot of you know what you need to plan ahead in your journey uh so then moving on if you know i i have to summarize uh, some of the success factors that you know one should have is institutionalizing a task force uh you know i mentioned about it that esg is not just you know the job of one person or a team of a esg function but it really belongs to the desk of the ceo it should be supported by the leadership it should be championed by the board and it should be you know believed in by each and every person of your company of your entire organization so never feel shy of uh, you know collaborating with people asking them the questions because often esg uh, you know will overlap with your procurement with your legal with your finance with your coos so uh, i think asking for help wherever required is is very important but having like a unified decision making when it comes to critical esg decision making process is very important um second is that it is a marathon not a sprint uh, like i mentioned and the idea is that esg is really a journey of getting better and cascading the effect of esg horizontally as well as vertically as much as possible now some of the examples could also be that you know while people are looking at the climate risk for example currently uh, if you can also explore wherever applicable uh, the concept of tnfd right the nature related financial disclosures or it could be gender mainstreaming or it could be human rights uh, due diligence for that matter um so that topic is on on and one example the other example is also whether you how you can cascade it to your tier 2 or tier 3 supply chain uh, within your portfolio companies right so the idea is to get you know bigger and better when it comes to esg but like i said it is not something that you can you know do it overnight uh, and it's a journey Uh, the third thing again and i i think uh, this is something that uh, you know we we should do it better is to share your success stories not just with your investors but you know with all your stakeholders it could be as part of your annual reports your sustainability reports your quarterly reports um and that i believe is you know very important because uh, with that the idea is that you bring your stakeholders into your sustainability conversations right in order to talk about your story you should be bringing them in a conversation and be very transparent about you know esg being a work in progress uh, rather than a result that you are you know trying to sort of emulate and if you fail to really tell your story well you know what it is doing is that you are missing out on the opportunity to attract capital to attract talent your customers build trust with your partners and regulators and more importantly also to inspire advocacy so that way i feel it's very relevant uh having a robust esms is a must and you know this is one of the things that uh, you know i've i've worked on a lot in sort sort of uh, revising it 360 degree uh, you know in in my earlier organization as we advanced uh, you know in the fund but as we all know that a management system is a set of processes and practices to consistently implement a company's uh, policies to meet the business objectives and similarly on esg aspect as well one of the very important or a key feature is the concept of improving and revising your esms over time so keeping it as recent as possible tweaking it uh, you know as your fund or your uh, uh, you know investment advances and as you diversify your investment so you know bringing in the additionality and not just taking it to the annual uh, you know cycle of revising it uh, maybe you on paper you can revise it on an annual basis but the idea is that you know you already start practicing some of the good practices uh, that you feel uh, will add value to your portfolio uh, 
um the another aspect i feel is very relevant is sometimes you know when we are working within an organization we we become very near sighted or at the most you know it's towards our portfolio companies but having a fresh perspective and i know we do have sometimes the risk committee and we have the board and we have the investment committee but having a esg expert committee uh, can become a, a very uh, promising bet i believe because uh, you know they are the experts they've been working with other organizations as well and they could really add value so explore if you know you can voluntarily set up a, a sounding board sort of an esg expert committee which can keep feeding in uh, you know a lot of information to you um the last one and my favorite one is walking the talk uh, you know personalizing it so you know we i strongly believe that you know we we need to personify esg in our daily lives walking the talk you know in in the way we live in the way we you know impact our circle of influence uh, and that's what is very important because uh, it's really the intent uh, the purpose and you know how we are living esg in our day to day lives which if successful uh, you know can really impact esg as a function within an organization Uh, so with that you know as a concluding remark i believe that you know today we all are in a phase of collective enlightening when it comes to uh, you know esg uh, and the role that it can play in succeeding uh, the corporations within the society meeting the expectations of employees of customers and investors so you know while others or i would say while uh, you know largely majority of the people are you know seldom dipping their toe in the uh, you know the esg waters now is the time to really deep dive in and take that plunge uh, with full confidence and with full passion thank you utsav uh, sankalp team thank you very much uh, tejasuni for that very insightful uh, uh, journey through the whole process and the question uh, the esg success factors uh, one quick question uh, we had was uh, basically you mentioned that you know having a customized and simple screening tool at the beginning of the screening process especially having a sectoral focus can help uh, give risks and opportunities could you be able to, and you mentioned that you had a esg tool which you know you shared with others for continuity so could you would you be able to give a practical example of how having such a tool at an early stage uh, helped you identify a risk and opportunity yeah sure it's also i believe one is definitely all the funds requirements which will include your you know the investor or your lp requirements should be included in the tool but what is important at the screening stage is we stick to the high level right the high level risks uh, so it could be the red flags it could be your exclusion list that you need to include in uh, as an additionality because uh, you know i i was representing the climate impact focus fund we wanted to bring out the uh, positive impact that the deal could have uh, you know on the fund and that's where i included within that tool which again you know like i said uh, you know everybody can make their own tool it was just a simple excel tool which i made but it was like a ready reckoner which not only i was using but everybody in the investment team was using so i developed that you know the positive enablers in terms of you know when you put in the x value that you are planning to invest and then what is the value of the number of jobs it could create uh, you know the greenhouse gas emissions it should be able to avoid over you know 5 years or 7 years whatever your investment period is so having those quick numbers especially during your pre ic uh, you know really helps for the larger audience uh, you know numbers always matters to the financial professionals right so using this tool to come out with uh, the financial output is very important sure thank you very much uh, tejaswini i also appreciated what you said about pushing the ball on esg by considering the conditions precedent uh, over and above what is usually done to take into account the culture the mindset of the uh, promoter and uh, that was a really important point thank you so much sure. for sharing we'll move on to somya uh, who will be taking us through esg as a value creation strategy for better impact outcomes over to you somya 
thank you, sir. And I think Tejaswini and Smita have said the stage really well on how in, uh, ESG should be integrated within the investment process itself. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, how we have used that as a value creation strategy to really enhance the operations of our uh, portfolio company as well. So, um, one second. You can see my screen move. Okay, great. So when you, um, as a person who's managing impact and ESG, right, I often get asked the difference between impact and ESG and how do we view it, right? And the way I see this is both are required to make a business successful. Uh, so impact uh, is an outcome to assess the company's intention and potential to create a sustainable impact. Right. And ESG, of course, is a framework or a tool uh, to systematically strengthen the company's operations, right, internal operations to create better impact outcomes. Right. Uh, and um, essentially, to give you an example, a company might be focusing on creating social impact in terms of offering the best uh, services or products that are most beneficial to the underserved communities. Uh, to or to enhance their living uh, standard of living. However, if the business operations are polluting, has inefficient use of resources, poor labor and working conditions, or even governance, then it would ultimately lead to poor impact outcomes. So therefore, it's very important to have both of them, right? And I would like to take you through a quick case study uh, on uh, NEPRA, Avishkar's, uh, Avishkar Capital Investing Company that uh, basically I want to cover both aspects of impact in ESG. So this is how, um, you know, the waste mountain looks uh, like today in India. And to give you generally a scale of the problem itself, right? So India generates about 65 to 70 million tons of waste annually. So about 43 million tons of waste is collected and one fourth of that is recycled. And the remaining is dumped in landfills. And about 22% is dry waste completely comprising of uh, pa paper, plastic, glass, and metal cans. And most of the waste ends up in landfills due to non-availability of appropriate infrastructure, right, to manage them. And especially uh, the problem is acute because the waste is not uh, segregated at source, right? And this was identified as a, a complex social problem. Um, and to understand this, you also need to understand how the supply chain of waste management is first, right? So most of the dry waste collection and segregation in India, so it continues to be undertaken through informal channels. You have waste pickers, um, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, the lift and shift model where, you know, it's picked up from one location and dropped in the other. So it's highly unregulated, unorganized. Then uh, there is, of course, inefficient uh, supply chain. Um, on one hand, your waste pickers are exploited um, because of malpractices, tampered weight, lack of transparency in pricing and delayed payments. And there is also uh, municipalities have, have found it very challenging to integrate these informal workers who depend on waste picking uh, for their livelihood. So additionally, also, if you see waste pickers find it extremely hard to get employment due to the social taboo associated with the form of livelihood, right? So around the beginning of 2010, Avishkar identified this as a complex social and environmental problem. And uh, there was, you know, increasing magnitude of waste generation in India. And there is an associated, you know, environmental and societal problem. So we started to look for innovative and viable and sustainable models that can solve this problem. So we were looking at various global and Indian models as well. And we realized the majority of waste management businesses use lift and shift model. So we basically transporting waste to landfill site in exchange of a tipping fee that's paid by to the local municipality, right? And these models were not fundamentally addressing the underlying issue of waste management, right? And further, um, we believe that, um, of course, because you're creating that landfill, there is a potential health and an environmental hazard that's uh, taking place. So we built our entire investment and impact thesis around the thought process. And uh, we were actively looking at business models that can solve this complex social problem. Um, 
right? So we came across uh, NEPRA Resource Management. It started in 2006, based in Gujarat. So uh, Avishkar found this company in 2012, um, right? And the company aims to build an organized and re reliable driveways management uh, supply chain in India. And by connecting uh, the waste generators to the waste collectors, uh, which is the informal waste pickers. And the company only deals with dry waste, such as paper, plastic, metal, glass, owing to the difficulties in segregation and disposal of semi-dry and wet waste, right? So uh, if you see, the company today has a fully mechanized state-of-the-art infrastructure, and that's how it's creating efficiencies in sorting. Uh, in addition, it uses a technology platform for optimization of collection. So it monitors the location of collection agents, waste collectors, and schedules picked up, uh, pick up um, in real time, right? You can you know where uh, the waste is being picked up and you know how the route is uh, being, uh, or where is it being taken. And it provides real time information of the collection, um, you know, mix as well. Uh, so this helps NEPRA operations and sales uh, team plan uh, the waste um, recycling better or management better. Um, so this is how the company has intervened in the waste supply chain today. So on the waste generation or the supply side, you have NEPRA's collection intervention. So collection of waste from directly from industries, waste pickers, commercial establishments. They're integrating informal waste pickers in the formal supply chain. Uh, they're also paying fair uh, and transparent prices. Um, and I'll come to it a little bit on how they're doing this. On the demand side of uh, waste, of course, NEPRA's processing and sales intervention is happening. So they're segregating plastic waste and, you know, giving it to recyclers. They're also, because the waste is segregated properly, it's high quality. And they're also selling this directly to uh, industries, uh, right, uh, for as an alternative to fuel, fossil fuel, uh, especially cement industry. Um, here again, this is um, an EPRA's fully mechanized material recovery facility. Waste is segregated using optical sorters and uh, wet waste is also treated on site and the dry recyclable waste is sent for further processing. So today, if you see, NEPRA has uh, uh, about 600 metric ton of waste that it can recycle every day. Um, in terms of uh, key ESG risk, right? So what, what have, what, we identified as a key ESG risk and how did we mitigate it? Like for efficient waste management, tracking of waste collection was very, very important at the collection point to bring in efficiencies, right? And this required a tech intervention. So the mobile uh, app that they use today is used for route planning and optimization. So this was very, very important. The second is the whole objective is to have all the waste recycled end to end. Uh, it was important to look at this holistically usage of mixed waste, which was sent previously to landfill, now is being used as, uh, you know, refuse uh, derived fuel uh, for cement companies as a substitute uh, to fossil fuels. Then um, it's also important to strengthen the internal governance and processes. So it documented all the policies of waste management, HR, including employee welfare, health and safety aspects. You have people working in the, you know, MRF facilities. So, you know, how can you, uh, the company had to focus on the health and safety aspect of them working. Um, then one of the crucial problems in waste collection management sector is child labor. So NEPRA was able to, you know, uh, put a facial recognition to eliminate, eliminate the risk. Right, only registered waste pickers uh, with the company can sell the waste to the company, right? And that was very important. Then the other thing is transparency and traceability in pricing, which is a major problem in uh, waste collection, right? So NEPRA introduced digital weighing and auto pricing to create this transparency, especially through UPI integration. They were able to pay the waste pickers digitally, and there were no leakages in the system. And most importantly, while running a plant at the scale and size, it's very important to ensure uh, sound working conditions for the workers. So ensuring proper EHS, mandatory awareness orientation, health and safety precautions for all employees, safety equipment, all of that need to be done. So these were some of the key risk areas that were identified for the company and mit mitigations were put in place. 
uh, to enhance its operations. So really, when you look at uh, value creation, right, because these ESG practices were adopted, uh, there was value creation for the business on impact outcomes and the ecosystem here. And this is a snapshot, right? So since Avishkar's investment, Nipra has procured and recycled about 168,000 uh, metric tons of waste, which would have otherwise ended up in landfills. Uh, they have reduced about 2.3 metric ton, uh, 2.3 million metric tons of carbon emissions. Uh, it currently uh, collects, sorts, and segregates, like I said, over 600 metric tons of uh, waste every day in four cities of Ahmedabad, Indore, Pune, and Jamnagar. And it has also empowered 2,000 waste pickers, 30% of whom are women, by providing them with dignity and better livelihood opportunities. Some of these waste pickers are also hired in their you know, material recovery facilities as uh, into formal employment, right? Uh, and the waste pickers have received a cumulative payout of $9.3 million um, up until uh, CY21. So by creating an organized waste collection supply chain and they have eliminated the whole middleman, they are able to increase the livelihood opportunities or the income of the waste pickers. NEPRA is also able to offer uh, stable and high income. Uh, so here again, um, they have employed about, um, sorry, I can't see the screen. Can you see it now? About 950 employees uh, in their uh, facilities. So again, what this has contributed is because they, were, they are tracking carbon emissions, they're contributing to India's net zero goals. Because they have brought in supply chain efficiencies, uh, they uh, by streamlining collection, sorting, and uh, recycling, they have enhanced the stakeholders by enabling partners meet their EPR and sustainability targets. And EPR is extended producer responsibility, right? So they have helped the partners achieve that. Then they've also increased the income of waste pickers by almost 20 to 30% because they've removed all the intermediaries, digital payments, transparency in pricing, all of that. And so here, having an impact as a core value aligned to the business model and adopting ESG. And this is how NEPRA today has become a responsible company and the largest dry waste management company in India. And I just have one more slide, a quick snapshot on what are the things we need to keep in mind uh, while looking at ENS, right? We need to understand the macro context of things. Uh, it's very important that you deep dive into the context, geography, and business activities. Without understanding this, you will never be able to highlight what are the critical ENS gaps of the company itself. And very important to understand the key stakeholders of the business. You need to focus on relevant ENS uh, action plans. I think this is also something the Tejaswini brought up. You can't solve the world problem or you can't solve every problem. You need to identify what is critical to the business operations. And you require a dedicated person team for focused attention. And it's always a shared responsibility. You have to have an ESG team that does it and the investment team also helping. So if you are able to keep all of these in mind, you can definitely have ESG as a value creation strategy. Uh, I'll stop here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Soumya. That was really insightful. Uh, the whole business model of the company and what you took us through. Uh, just had a, a quick question. And uh, also, Smita had uh, alluded to this uh, on effective and, you know, uh, effective communication and disclosure. And what uh, also uh, Tejaswani mentioned about having a sounding board at the end of the whole cycle to uh, share the success story. So what would you highlight as a kind of, you know, success of this and how would you communicate uh, the success of this uh, project uh, at the end of the investment cycle uh, to the next set of investors? I think really, I mean, it's not about success or thing, right? So at the beginning of the thing, you always need to identify what are the key four, three, four metrics that are most relevant for the company. And if you are able to show progress on that, that's that would be critical. It can't be you're starting at a low efficiency and you're ending up with an even lower efficiency in terms of ENS, right? So there needs to be growth. So very important to have those three, four KPIs identified for the company 
and you know being able to work with a company to reduce carbon emissions or you know to uh, you know create business at scale so that able to uh, recycle more waste so very very important therefore very important to understand the business activities thank you and this is a question for both speakers uh, i think tejaswini is just uh, left the conversation but what are the costs incurred for computing the esg metrics uh, last question and then we'll uh, close the session thank you so may so you want us. to take it a controversial thing <laughs> uh of course it data, data has always been a challenge right i mean that has been like across it's not just india it's globally across the world uh, data and the cost of uh, esg compliance so to say but i think one should look at it and somehow you can add from your practical experience one should look at it more from uh, you know uh, cost versus benefit so i not look at it as a cost so to say but look at it more from an investment standpoint so what are you doing which can actually uh, improve your value which which you uh, create because of incorporating such considerations you know and uh, uh, given that markets are maturing you know across the world not just for from an esg standpoint but also from you know a holistic sustainable finance standpoint uh and there are more regulations coming in which are mandating you know more disclosures not just from the financial sector but also from the corporate sector i think it's a matter of time when these things kind of mature you know and then the costs will go down so again when you're talking about data itself uh, it's about um, the companies are all already tracking their uh, financial metrics right they have some form of mis and this would be uh, if you identify three or four kpis that are very closely linked to the business itself right then there is no additional investment you're just tracking you know three four kpis that are most relevant for the company the other thing is of course uh, uh, to understand what metrics you need to calculate or even to understand the risk you may need to hire consultants or you may need to bring in that expert so cost would be there but with respect to data itself i think the technology would probably cost but not otherwise great thank also, you so I much also i think just another point i wanted to add you know in terms of measuring the esg metrics you know with uh, all these new models which are coming up which kind of uh, look at leveraging technology for uh, you know data monitoring data capturing i think uh, it's 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 going to be uh, the initial cost will be there but the recovery period the payback period over of that uh, is going to improve you know? great thank you thank you so much smita and somya and uh, tejasvini as well for their insightful presentations and sharing that uh, valuable time with us we really appreciate it uh, we invite everyone to keep in touch over the uh, platform the whoever platform so if you have any more questions please do get in touch with me um, and uh, i'll be happy to forward your questions thank you again for the audience for all your participation and patience and uh, we look forward to the rest of the session and feel free to explore the rest of the conference uh, one announcement i have is that uh, we're launching a challenge fund uh, for uh, climate civil society organizations in india in partnership with the shakti foundation uh, we'll be posting more information on that on the intellect app linkedin and twitter so please do uh, get in touch if you want more information on that so thank you and have a nice day